Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we have the pleasure of having Samuel Crescencio with us. Welcome, Samuel. Hi there, guys. Thank you. Now, as we usually do on The Focus, we start by explaining why do we have um, the people that we interview on the podcast. I've had the pleasure of um, knowing Samuel for many years. I think maybe the first time we met in person was in 2011 in Salt Lake City, yes. Utah, right? At yeah, more than 10 years now. That's right, at the Agile conference there. And uh, we struck up friendship. We kept on um, conversating, uh, collaborating over the years. And um, that's why we're delighted to have Samuel with us. So Samuel, tell us a little bit about your river of life. All right. So first, I uh, really appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure uh, not only to share, but as always to learn with you guys. Um, well, I am a software developer for almost 30 years now, actually 28 years. Um, I started developing software before internet existed in Brazil and then went through, you know, all the waves of new technologies and methods. I, I think I am uh, lucky enough to, uh, to, have, uh, to have had the opportunity to, to be introduced to lean and agile methods very early. So in 2003, I started uh, practicing extreme programming, lean and scrum, and, and then we started evolving since then. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, you know, since I got the benefits, I realized the benefits that we can get from these methods. I kind of uh, started sharing the, the, the news, sharing the message out there. And uh, I ended up being one of the co-founders of the Agile Brazil Conference. And then later on, I joined the board of directors of the Agile Alliance, where I stayed as a board member for five years. And there is where I, I got to know Horia. And, um, and since then, I've been working uh, with software development and also with uh, cultural and organizational transformation. So helping other companies to understand how things work, work with Lean and Agile and then adopt and then transform themselves. Uh, for since 2015, I've been running a company called Lean It 101, where we do exactly that. So we usually help uh, uh, from small startups to large corporations. Uh, and uh, um, apart from the professional side, I am father of four. I married for 20 years and uh, dating the same uh, wife for 25 years. Recently, we just uh, um, celebrated our uh, anniversary. And uh, I also like some sports like uh, mountain biking, longboarding downhill and uh, motorcycle riding. Uh, so I think that's a bit of my life. Thank you very much for that, Samuel. But you also participated in the original research that we done in Adaptive Oversight. You were part of the panel uh, as well. And I'd like to dive into that a little bit later uh, with you to show you what, what we've actually now, how we have evolved. Um, but let, let, let's, let me start off by asking, you talked about uh, the cultural and transformation work that you do. Um, and I'm going to start off with a, with, with a can of worms uh, asking you, um, what do you think uh, is the role that oversight and governance play in that whole con uh, cultural transformation process? Well, uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, and actually, I think that when leaders fail to, to, to play that role, uh, usually, uh, transformation endeavors are 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 doomed to fail. Uh, and uh, as I think that one of the most important uh, uh, roles that a leader has to play when we are talking about uh, cultural and organizational transformation is change management. It is really to understand where we are. Uh, where we want to be and what are the challenges that we need to overcome uh, to, to get there. And especially to steer the team towards that direction. And uh, 
when I see that leaders, especially the executive leaders of an uh, organization, engage in, in that with, with the changing team, like uh, in the actual gamble of change management, I believe that uh, the chance, chances for success are much higher. And, and uh, the other way around is also true. I think if, if, if leaders fail to participate on actually to take the lead of that, I think it's very important uh, that change management is not outsourced, but really done by, by who owns the business. And, uh, and I think that uh, if they participate, chances for success are, are much higher. And if they don't, uh, we, we may fail, I, I believe. And uh, I've seen some uh, transformation projects that have failed because of that, because of lack of participation, lack of engagement from leadership. And sometimes leadership just expects uh, expect people to change and you know things to change, but they don't they themselves they don't don't change. Like they expect that the change will help will ha happen to their people, but not to them. And uh, unfortunately, that's not uh, is not the case. Well, and 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 that's so true. Uh, we we've seen that regularly. Is is that lack of engagement from uh, from the sponsorship or from the leadership um, has got this mentality? Is please consultancy come and change my people. You, I don't have to change. It's just you guys that needs to change. Yes. yes. So. Looking at from an oversight uh, and governance perspective, um, what would you say are the key things that they need to do in order to track and pay attention in change uh, or pay attention to in change management? Uh, key things. Um, so some of the things that I have seen, and, and I'm now talking about uh, large corporations, you know, from medium, medium size, let's say 1,000 people to 100,000 people, large enterprises. Uh, I believe that uh, there is a lot of dysfunctionality uh, in, in their structure. So usually they are structured using the old ways of thinking. And, and when we think about Lean and Agile, where we look for small autonomous teams, uh, existing structures, I think they, they are probably one of the main barriers that we can find in organizations uh, to, uh, uh, to that, that are preventing change. So I, I believe that one of the key functions is that these leaders, uh, besides engaging in the change management, they should take a close look at how their teams are organized, how their areas are structured, and try to break the silos, try to, to create more cross-functional teams. And, and sometimes, uh, as, as I've seen, the, the way things are structured uh, would, would not work with an agile, just because they are too much into silos or departments where people tend to, to hand off things to one another. And I think that's very hard. It's very easy to find People say, well, that's not my job anymore. I've done my part. Uh, now I've passed, I passed the, the best. And, and I think that's that's the hard part. And uh, organizations that try to change their culture without changing their structure, I think they they may they may be risking the entire change project, I think. So that's I a... think this is one of the key aspects. Yeah. Okay. Um... Let me challenge that a little bit, um, Samuel. Mm -hmm. Please. This is a, a really um, challenging area. Think about it this way. I've seen organizations that go the other way around and every three months or so, oh, let's have another reorganization. Oh, yeah. That's, a, <laughs> okay. that's another problem. Yeah. Okay. So um, what I wanted to challenge is if we overemphasize the value of structure over that of collaboration, then we may have a difficulty, right? I agree. Because ultimately, agree. the fundamental difficulty is we have our own silos, and yet we need yeah. to pay attention to the value stream, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think we need to get rid of the extremes in, in the scale. Uh, but think this way, like, you are structured in this way, like you have your functional manager, 
But then somebody decided that, well, we're going to develop a new product. Let's create a cross organizational team and let's do it in the agile way. And then uh, the team itself is pushing to, to some areas while your manager is, is, is not only pushing, but is really measuring you using other metrics. Like uh, you are expected to deliver this, but you are measured the other way. Your bonus will fail if you don't, you know, if you don't achieve your goals, but uh, your goals are not uh, related to what you need to do now. So I think it's a, uh, it's like a snooker game is is, uh, is is really challenging. Uh, probably would need to to change a little bit of uh, each, and and do that uh, like uh, continuously until we get the you know uh, the right structure in place, the right uh, uh, compensation model in place, and and things like that. Yeah, organically evolving the structure seems like a really useful way of going about it. Um, you have people that say, well, um, reorganizations don't really help all that much. Well, um, the challenge is in most large organizations, our cognitive capacity being small as it is, we need to figure out a way of having some span of coordination. Because if I have to collaborate with 5,000 people across the globe, uh, it's too hard. You know? yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. Managing a, an address book of, of 5,000 individuals is too hard, right? But if mm -hmm. I have to collaborate with a handful of people, oh, that's easy. Yeah, I can, I can do that. And each of them can have five people and each of those can have five people. And ah, there you go. You have 5,000 people, yeah. right? So yeah. this um, network um, effect is really... Uh, what's at play here that that's the reason why we have these kind of concentrations of of span of conversation communication and often control right so an interesting question here is particularly from the perspective of oversight yeah how do we help people in positions of oversight to notice better what the organization is all about, what the team, what the uh, product community is all about? Well, you're only asking hard questions here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, again, um, uh, I, I last uh, three years, I've spent uh, most of my time in one of these large organizations. And uh, and we were not in the software industry. We were in the energy industry. So trying to adopt, uh, try no, we were adopting agile practice and lean thinking to help manage uh, a large and globally distributed energy business. And and so some of the things that I I, I saw there is is that uh, sometimes people suffer. People the the ground workers they suffer because they cannot demonstrate to their bosses what they are doing. And, uh, and just because of the culture of the company is not as easy as saying, all right, so let's invite, invite the boss for a gamble walk. Uh, I, I, I wish it was easy like that, but uh, I think uh, in the real world, it's not, it's not that easy. Uh, I've seen people struggling so much not only with their bosses, but uh, with let's let's suppose this, this scenario: uh, you have a uh, business area that is depending on another business area. Let's say maybe IT. The IT guys have to develop solutions to the business, and uh, the business is is urging for those solutions, but uh, they they are not being able to go through because of uh, you know. Uh, different policies that they have. Maybe they don't, they don't have the budget. Maybe they have other restrictions. And uh, using the, the normal ways of, 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 of getting your product through the ITR and then get the results you want, sometimes does not work. And I've seen people saying that they would have to escalate the problem. And I, I haven't seen that only once. I mean, that was a common pattern that I saw. Uh, you can't solve your problem through the normal, you know, ways. And then you need to escalate. You need to ask your boss to talk to the boss of the other guy that's not doing the job. 
and and I think this is is really it's also dysfunctional because it's gonna break trust and it's gonna generate probably more problems than than uh, benefits. Uh, but I believe that if we can create a work environment where we can show the value that we are being able to deliver, and especially if we can show like uh, metrics that that can demonstrate the throughput of value, how we are flowing things through. And we can invite somehow, you know, the bosses and the leaders to, to come up and, and see, you know, in practice the Genshi Genbutsu, to see with their eyes. I believe that this is really the best way to expose what's really going on and to invite them to the game. Uh, but sometimes uh, this opportunity is not uh, easy to, to, to find. Uh, I think it was easier before pandemic because uh, before pandemic we would all work in a you know common workplace we could just have our visual management in there from time to time the boss would would, would get around but nowadays it's the, it doesn't work like that everybody works from home we don't have a wall with our standard visual management and the boss is not passing by you know uh, i think it's it's much more difficult we need to create this virtual gambas and uh the boss will not be passing by. Uh, it's harder to invite them to come and take a look. But I think this is the way. I think uh, if we use proper visual management and we invite the stakeholders and, and whoever is responsible for, for the flow to come in and then and join and check, I think that's that's the best way to, to do that. So one I followed a little bit into that rabbit hole you talk about standardized or standard visual management uh, practices um, but most of those practices work quite well in a co-located situation um, what do you think are some of the things or tricks or ideas that uh, organizations can do to still have standard visual management but for remote working or in remote working situations? What would work well and, and so on? What are the tips and tricks? Right. Um, I think in, in, in this situation, we have a common challenge that is related to the technology we have available. Uh, because let's say sometimes we use a specific tool to, uh, to manage our cards or our Kanban flow. Uh, we may use another tool to, you know, to manage the the orders of the service. We may have another two to check the metrics. And I, I think the challenge is how to integrate them all in a single visual place. And, and uh, this is exactly, I think, the, the challenge that we all have uh, this. And, and uh, my, my previous example was uh, actually uh, a subsequence of that because in order to create that uh, single place with all the tools we need integrated, we needed the IT guy so much. But the IT guy said, well, we have other things to do now. We don't have a budget for that now. And, and how the, the guys that work in business areas would be able to, to build that? Uh, and especially with all those you know, restrictive policies that usually IT has, I think that's a bit of a challenge. But if we get out of that uh, business of large corporations, let's say we are into a small growing startup with a few hundred people, I think in that scenario it's much easier because we have uh, you know more decision making power available. We probably may have more uh, tools and you know technological capabilities available. I think it's easier to deal with that. And the way I'm looking to, you know, I'm constantly trying to do that is to have, I'm not uh, being paid for any of these tools that I'm going to mention here, but uh, just as an example, tools like uh, Muro or Miro, uh, where you can have like an infinite uh, zoom in and out uh, board where you can put wherever you want. Uh, I think I, I have uh, been able to get the best results when I concentrate the entire visual management in one of these tools. The problem, as I said, is, is, is how to get everything in there. Uh, like if you have uh, another two for the Kanban, another two for the metrics, you need to get all of them integrated in there. Uh, sometimes it's not that easy, but sometimes what you need to do is to, to build that integration, make it work, you know, 
pay the price for that and uh, usually it's worthwhile. Mm. You mentioned uh, something that, that made me think about. Uh, it's not just a tool, but there's also a human factor to this. And, and that's this little word called discipline. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've noticed um, many IT uh, people came up with specific solutions for an executive that wanted some reports and they built a nice dashboard, etc. But the executive's behavior is still asking people for statuses instead of trying to log in uh, and actually go and look at the, the dashboard that was created for them. So what can we do in terms of that human behavioral elements uh, that, that you found? You work with change management and organizational change, and a big portion of that is establishing those habits and maintaining that discipline to keep to that habits. What do you think uh, can uh, organizations can do in that? Right. So first, uh, as most as possible, I try to automate this plane. <laughs> That's, I, I don't know if you can understand it, but what I mean is I try to replace this plane by automation. Because uh, if we need like somebody to go there and every day collect the metrics and put in the spreadsheet and update the thing, you know, that might fail. This guy mm -hmm. might be sick one day, you know, that may be not collected. And so uh, as much as possible, I try to automate any kind of manual work that has to be done in order to report to the boss. That's, I think, the first step. And the second, I, I remember a story when... Uh, when the big boss uh, was saying, well, where is the transformation? I'm not seeing it, he was saying. We, we were started like a three months earlier and uh, you know some teams were engaging, but he was not engaging. And then one day he came to me to chart, where is the transformation? I'm not seeing it. And then I, I told him, well, how about if you engage and demonstrate how it's done to your, to your teammates? And then he got shocked with that. And, and my, for my, I think, uh, <laughs> I, 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 think uh, I, had, uh, I, have, I had probably three or four times where I had to confront the status quo in a way that I could be fired as a consultant, as an external you know, intruder or somebody, <laughs> an outsider that's trying to help. I could easily be fired because of that confronting you know status quo and in this situation uh i was looking off that the boss went home and and he probably slept over you know what i what i i told him and in the other day uh he put himself to work and to he did what was needed uh, uh, uh he did what was needed he he basically designed a value stream. He designed a Kanban flow with full of flow policies to, to him to manage the strategic uh, 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 strategic projects that he, he had in the portfolio. He he did that. He built himself uh, the flow and started inviting his managers in a daily basis to go and look to the flow. And that changed everything. That changed mm -hmm. everything. In the moment that he started acting as the other uh, you know the other the rest of the team was supposed to act everybody else, else started following and and they think that worked like magic uh, <laughs> i will try to do that again <laughs> so this this makes me think about uh one of the the principles from um in team based leadership that david mokai uh did that, that whole body of knowledge he talks about act your way to new thinking um, and this is exactly the, the example of this executive that acted his way to new thinking and the, the, the process generated new insights, et cetera. Um, so that, that, that's really cool. You uh, mentioned earlier about uh, something uh, about people low down needing to ask permission to do something and that permission gets escalated higher up and, and higher up. So the way that if you think if, if you think of it through the lens of lean, um, it's quite a long feedback cycle uh, in there. And one of the ways that uh, organizations can do uh, to, to short circuit that is to 
follow this mantra of push authority to information. Again, another David Mokai um, uh, from the David Mokai principles is to push the authority to where the information is. Now, with that whole background, I wanted to ask you, um, I've never worked in South America and I'm, 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 I don't really know a lot of the context of South American organizations. Um, how do you think those types of principles uh, works in, in a South American uh, context in, in organizations? How, how well would does something like that work? Um, so let me see if I understood it correctly. Uh, when, I, when I was like uh, uh, providing my example, oh, my base is, comes from Brian Merrick, uh, teach or lead by example. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in terms of uh, South American people, and especially Brazilian people, we are considered to be friendly, friendly people. So we usually, uh, we have a culture of touch feeling, you know, we have a culture of uh, touching people, kissing people, hugging people. I think that's, that's very different from, from Europe or even the United States. When I started traveling, I understood, you know, the big cultural differences that we had. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I believe that this kind of uh, behavior, I mean, if you try to teach by or lead by teaching or lead by being an example of what you want to, to happen, I think that works very well in Brazil because of this friendly aspect of, of our culture. And, um, uh, and inter, interpersonal relationships, I think uh, also play a very important role in that. When I arrived in this big uh, energy organization, most of the people in there were already uh, pissed off with one another. They, they, they. I mean, the the lack of uh, structured processes, roles, and responsibilities, you know, and they were very much into the ad hoc work, and and I believe that uh, that generated a lot of uh, problems to them. And uh, it was a little bit hard to fix that in the beginning because people uh, were already hurt by, you know, by the system. And, and they were afraid, they were, they were not feeling safe at all to do anything. And I remember once when I, I heard one guy, that, that guy was a manager, a high-level manager, and he said, don't expect me to say that in front of the boss because I want. <laughs> I remember exactly his, his words. And and when I see that is an, is an example of lack, lack of safety. And, and when we don't have that safety where we can have an open and frank dialogue with people, regardless of their position, like uh, I could be talking to the CEO of the company, but if you don't have safety to have an open and frank dialogue, uh, it's harder because you, you, you may not trust your boss. Uh, I've seen people fearing to be fired just because they were using now visual manager, they, they would say, mm. oh, this is just for my boss to see what I'm doing. This is just for my boss to fire me if I'm doing anything wrong. So I think it's a, uh, we need to walk, walk our way through building trust. I think that's the first thing. And then we will be able to, to accept a leader that is leading by example. Uh, otherwise, we, if we don't have the safety, I think even we being a friendly, uh, you know, friendly people, I think uh, it wouldn't work anyway. So follow up question on that. Um, you've talked about safety and establishing that culture of safety for people to be willing to take risk and learn from that and all, all of that. What is it you, do, you, do you think that oversight and governance practitioners or people in an oversight uh, uh, capability need to do to ensure that safety is established for um, whatever is going to happen between a manager and a team. What, 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 let, let's, look, let's look at that one step removed is what do the oversight function need to do to ensure that happens? Um, so if we have a dysfunctional culture already, 
mm. that will be harder. But let's say if we are growing up a new team or a new company, nowadays we have a lot, lots of uh, you know new startups that are grown. They they started big already. They they have uh, investors and you know hundreds of people. They already have a culture since since the beginning. Um, if they are building up the, their culture, I think it's much easier because they can uh, they can um, you know gradually uh, build up that safety through small examples like uh, every day uh, the, the people that are in oversight positions they can grow their people they can coach they can teach their people mm -hmm. I think that will be easier to get there but if you if you are in a dysfunctional culture and you need to change that uh, I think uh, it's much more difficult I, I believe that uh, in order to do that leaders would first have to really acquire trust uh, with their, you know, team members, and um, and 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 for that, uh, you know, we all have seen a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings working well, but these days I I've heard or I read a phrase from a leader from a tech leader, and he said this. He said that his best boss never had to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him but his worst boss had those like every week so it it depends on uh, uh, on how you use to to lead your people uh, if you are in a in a in an environment that you lack safety i think you need more one-on-ones but if you have an open you know, open field for for discussions where people can can feel safe. I think uh, you may not need that. You you can lead your group uh, based on purpose and and based on actions that will will be like an example to them. Oh, I I I want to be like this guy because he does this, and and I want to do exactly the same thing. When you get inspired for what people really do, I think that's the best way to lead uh, change. Thank you, Samuel. Yeah, this uh, brings to mind the fact that the one-on-one -on -one session is just a tool. And as with any tool, it can be used to build, but it can be used to damage and destroy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and there's, uh, I've seen people crying right after one-on-one -on -one meetings with their bosses because it's exactly that. Their bosses would... Uh, would basically you know destroy their moral uh and and it's hard uh in this case it's really hard uh, i well i know that <laughs> let me share this for you i you know that i i have learned a lot of things from you and uh one of the things that i've noticed over time almost or more than 10 years that we know each other already is that um you are always looking to to look to things from a positive perspective, which I think it's 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 awesome. Uh, you don't have problems, right? You have opportunities, uh, but there are some situations where I think that cutting off the problem sometimes is is the best way to do. It. Like if you have toxic people around, even if they are leaders, my recommendation is to fire them. Is to replace. I, I, I see that sometimes uh, it's much more expensive to try to fix uh, personality of a leader than replacing the leader. Um, but of course, I will always try first to build them up. Uh, mm. But if, 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 if we can't, then there is no other option, I think, instead of replacing them. Isn't this fascinating? Because um, it's the foundation of emotional intelligence. Uh, we, we speak of emotional intelligence as awareness of emotion in ourselves and in others. So <clears throat> if a leader is described as being toxic, it's not that the person has some kind of weird toxicity about them. It's just their behavior is triggering unpleasant or harmful emotions in others, if you will. There's nothing wrong with pressure. 
with ambition, with yeah. um, being demanding. Yeah? But these can be taken to extremes and can become mm -hmm. toxic. Yeah? And there's yes. also under pressure, right? When I'm ignoring people, I'm not paying attention to people. That's also hurtful. Yes. <laughs> so I, I remember I remember one of my teammates in the other company that I had uh, once he asked me, where's the wipe? How do you call that wipe? Is the is the a whip? A whip. 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 Yeah. The whip. whip. Yeah. yeah. He asked me, where's the whip? And I said, what whip? <laughs> he said, you are being too soft. You need to put a little bit of pressure. And then we created a concept that I really like that we call inner pressure. Inner pressure is like a pressure that comes from inside out, from the team itself. But the team puts that pressure based on a common purpose that everybody shares. Mm. And then I think in this, you have still have the, the function of the oversight, the leader, but the leader is more like a support in providing inspiration, vision, you know, and guiding people than really putting pressure because the, the, the pressure itself comes from the team. And I think that's the, the best, the best thing to happen to a team is to have that kind of a scenario. Yeah. And see what I noticed that we're not doing well enough is we're not practicing enough gratitude. Um, mm. And why I say that is because too often I see people that just go to work and just show up and are just looking forward to the weekend. In other words, um, their inner feeling is, thank God it's Friday, right? And I'm mm -hmm. off for the weekend, as opposed to, uh, wow, it's so wonderful that it's Monday. I'm looking forward to spending uh, much of my time this week doing interesting, worthy, valuable work. So, Gratitude for the work, gratitude for our colleagues that help us, that we can actually uh, do things well with. This is something that um, as managers, as leaders, we're not encouraging, we're not supporting, we're not cultivating enough. What do you think? Yeah, well, and, and very interesting. Uh, today, I saw one of the best definitions of gratitude that I ever saw so far. Uh, the woman was saying that uh, gra gratitude is not like thanking God for what you have for life or thanking your, you know, your friends. Like That's like being educated. Uh, and uh, gratitude is, is really a change of perspective to what you are, you are having. Because you may be having a hard time, but if you change perspective, you can find the good lessons from that hard time. And, and I think that's really gratitude is when you look to things that, okay, what, what I can get out of this? And, uh, and, 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 you know, and use that as a, as a, as a power to, to promote change. And, and I, I will never forget, Horia, the, the day that we were walking in Salt Lake City you were basically coaching me without I am noticing, asking a lot of questions about what was happening. And then I was full of talking about myself and I, I asked you, okay, so tell me about your problems. And then you said, I have no problems. <laughs> I only have opportunities. So when you said that to me, I think that changed my life uh, really because uh I started looking to problems in a very different way from them on almost 10 years now or more than 10 years now. Um, I think that's the way I'd like to see uh, how gratitude should be. Even if we have a problem, we should be grateful uh, and uh, extract the important lessons and use those important lessons to grow as a human being in first place and as a, you know, a group, as a, you know, a team in second place. And uh, another important thing I think, uh, still about gratitude, but related to the purpose is, uh, I, I have uh, some friends that are really old like us, not really old, uh, middle age, let's say, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and they still don't know their purpose in life. 
And uh, one of these days I got, I got one of my friends struggling with her uh, son that was already a 20 years old guy that was depressive and was having some problems. And uh, I was asking, uh, I, I was trying to, uh, to help my friends to help his son to find his purpose. But then he told me, well, how can I help my son to find his purpose if I don't have mine yet? And then I, <laughs> I was like struggling with that because uh, actually I realized my purpose when I was probably 34 or 35 years old. But uh, these days I got another definition of purpose. And, and I think that uh, that may serve people that are listening to us here. Uh, because the first purpose, first and foremost purpose that everybody have, I think, is the is its own existence. Uh, first place as an individual, but uh, mainly as a family. So I have four kids. What if I don't do my my responsibilities of of uh, you know providing food and you know and 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 housing and everything else that the family needs? Well, that's my first and foremost purpose. And if I fail with that, I will fail with everybody else, with anything else. So I believe that uh, if we are grateful for what we have and uh, we attract more than what we, you know, uh, we, we attract what we call. And if we call what we have, that we are grateful for that, we're grateful for that, I think uh, chances are that we'll get more of that. And if you're grateful for good things, you're going to get more of good things. If, if we keep complaining about the bad things, you're going to get more bad things. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a cycle that we, we need to, to, to turn it from being a vicious cycle where you just keep complaining about the problems and you get more problems to a virtual cycle where you'll be grateful for problems, not problems, but the opportunities that you have and then you're going to get more of the, the good parts of that, I think. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating how, um, <laughs> because you're actively reframing the situation into problems, bring it on. <laughs> Just um, yeah. watch this, hold my beer kind of thing. <laughs> hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I really like that. Uh... It's... it's um, <laughs> what we're attracting is not within our control, right? Because the world changes and things may kind of collapse in a heap. And still what we learn can be so valuable, right? Because yeah. um, put it this way, none of us get out of life alive, right? Yeah. <laughs> so despite our best efforts of keeping in shape and practicing and so on, the body still ah, kind of creaks and yeah. deteriorates and so on. But that's not the point. The point is enjoying and squeezing every drop of enjoyment out of life while we have it and learn that the, there yeah. are seasons to life. And within each season, there are things to appreciate and to, to look forward to, right? Yeah. I, I was just going to compliment that... Uh... When we met, or, uh, I was struggling with that company that I had, and eventually I failed with that company. And uh, I remember that by that time, I was having a hard time to find joy because it looked like everything was difficult, you know. And mm -hmm. and and when we are going through a valley, you know, of difficulty, it's hard to find joy. It's hard to find, uh, you know, a reason to to smile or a reason you know to have a good you know pleasure and and uh, and in that same period in my life I started having kids and uh, the kids provided me part of that uh, also some of the sports that I like to practice like uh, that uh, promote adrenaline and things like that that would help me to find joy and, and when I was able to find joy, it would be much easier for me to, to fight the, the hard times. And uh, another interesting uh, thing that happened to me is that in one of these phases, I was really struggling. I was, you know, having uh, some, some crisis. And, uh, and basically, instead of complaining, I decided to do something that I like to do and, uh, and uh, believe in the future, you know, having faith that things would turn, uh, you know, I, I would get out of, of that phase in a better situation. 
And uh, actually, that just happened uh, because I started uh, building a solution that I, I really liked, but as a purpose, not because I wanted to sell or anything. But a couple of years later, I got a very nice contract selling that thing. So in my worst phase, I built something that, uh, you know, generated me a lot of opportunities later on in life. So I, I think that's kind of the, that's the kind of connection we need uh, to make. I have a follow-up question there. Sorry, Oria. Um, go, go ahead. Um, so Samuel, you and Ori have been talking about joy and cultivating it in what you do, etc. You also spoke about the role of leadership uh, earlier in, and how important that uh, that is for making change happen, etc. Um, so what are some of the things that you think leaders can do to cultivate joy within the teams that they work with? Um. I think uh, taking part with the team, uh, mm. pairing up with the team. Uh, I think first and foremost is important for the leader to know how the job is done. And I've seen a lot of leaders that are leading people that they they, they can't replace them. They they don't know how the thing is 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 done, mm. and then uh, therefore they are not able to play with the team. And and I think that's a. Uh, that's a hard, hard part. Uh, I like leaders that know how to do what's being done by the team. And anytime they can sit together and they do, it to, they can do it together. They are capable of, of teaching people, even mm. teaching people. So I think if leaders can do that from time to time, they will build a much stronger, you know, relationship with their teammates. And uh, I think that also. Of course, depending on, on what's the approach of the leaders, but usually that will generate more trust and, uh, and, and things like that. Um, I think that would be one of my first recommendations towards, towards creating this. And in cases where leaders don't know the technical or don't have the technical competence, is at least showing a sense of curiosity in order and, and be, become the student uh, of that that person they they yes they work with. that that's yes. also i've seen that work quite well uh, uh. yeah I, and that made made me remember of uh when i was a young developer 20 years ago uh we were struggling to deliver you know something that we were late to deliver and uh i was one of the one of the developers that was working like in the core of the system. And uh, I think uh, a couple of other guys with me we were working to do that. And we needed to work uh, the entire weekends, you know, from sun to sun, uh, like 12, 14 hours a day, uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday. And, and the, the, the boss in that situation um, didn't know how to help us. I mean, he, he didn't have the skills to code with us, but he was there all the time with us. He, he was there like supporting, sitting together. Uh, and as you said, the cultivating curiosity and he would bring pizza, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so then he would make the team happy. He, he, even if we were working overtime, uh, he was there to support us. And I think that made a huge difference. And in other situations where I had the same same thing, having to work overtime, the boss would, you know, would go home six o'clock. Uh, everybody would be upset, not so engaged, mm -hmm. you know, would be complaining about the boss. And so I think if the boss can get together and do the thing together, even better. But if he or she doesn't uh, don't know how to do, you can sit together, you can ask questions, you can try mm -hmm. to help. I think uh, that's that's what should be done. Very good. Are we going to pivot here a little bit, Samuel? Um, when you participated in the original research in 2020 uh, with us around adaptive oversight in the panels, you recall we had those eight uh, panels for each of the sessions that we worked through using polarity mapping. Now, mm -hmm. um, fast forward a, a little bit uh, to, to earlier this year, Boria and I uh, sat and put our heads together and tried to figure out how do we put all of this 
because there's so much information there is how do we get it in a succinct uh, manner? How do we present it in a succinct way? And um, I'm going to share with you what we came up with. Um, and awesome. first of all is remember when engineers have to uh, have to create something artistic. Okay, uh, stop, stop <laughs> apologizing, Aldo. <laughs> um, <Just to> <laughs> sure. this, but I know the design of, uh, of developers. I know. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, so this is this is what we uh, this is what we came up with, and um, we 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 opted for um, the term called Galaxy View. So if we look at this uh, adaptive oversight in terms of a galaxy view, there are uh, regions that is too far away from the sun and then these regions that's too close to the sun. So what we were looking for is what would be that Goldilocks zone or what we ended up calling a thriving zone. So for instance, between trust and control, um, uh, so we still have those dynamics at play in trust and control, but as a way to have a discussion uh, around where do we find that balance, where's the, where's the balance in that, those two distinct polarities, uh, and we call that a thriving zone. So we came up with, with these uh, 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 balances uh, expressed in this way. Now, <clears throat> it's a far number, it's a lot, lot of thinking that's happened after we've engaged you, um, but I don't want to pre preempt it too much, just asking you, when you look at this now and you remember the journey that you participated in, uh, well, over two years ago um, from, from today, what are you noticing that we may have missed here? Well, first of all, um... It's been almost two years, I think, since we had the panels. And uh, I remember one of the things that I remember is that uh, the amount of information we got was immense. And, and, and the way you guys organized that and, uh, and facilitated, facilitated the, the meetings, I remember, I think I brought two different people also to, mm. to check and to share ideas. And I think... Uh, it's uh, it's really a lot of uh, knowledge that is, is structured. Um, I mean, it's hard to structure because it's 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 really a lot of things. And when looking to to this, uh, I think it's a very good way to you know to summarize to get the. Uh, to get the, the feeling of, of uh, what we were discussing by the time. And uh, I really like the geometric forms. I like the idea of the ga galaxy thing. Uh, uh, and uh, you still have the polarity things in there. Yes. Um, and I think that's great. I remember in 2008, a long time ago, I was in Buenos Aires for the first Latin American Agile Conference, and Mary and Tom Popendik were there. And in the end of the the uh, the conference, they asked them how they would look looking into the future, how, how they think that uh, Lean and Agile or Lean uh, would, would be like in the near future. And I think that uh, one interesting thing, I, if needed, I can, I think you still can find uh, that video online and I can, can share it with you. I think it's a, it's a great way of looking to that. Mary was saying exactly about this polarity. Uh, and I remember one of her phrases, should we have responsible manager or like inspire leaders, inspiring leaders? And, and the, 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 the answer is not, neither one or another what we need what we need is a combination of those because we cannot um, um, we, we cannot have high performance in something that we can't control and we probably cannot have high performance if we don't have a high level of trust and safety mm. and I, I think you are really balancing the things well one of the things that is like when I look to most of the the perspectives, I think it's 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 really great for me. I can understand, uh, and I can see the polarities. 
but when looking to the jar triangle and iron triangle, I know what you were meaning, but uh, I, I, I mean, I think I know what you're, what, what you want to say here. We are probably talking about the cost schedule and, and time triangle, is that? That's right. Uh, so for who knows that, I think uh, it's okay, they're gonna get it. But uh, if you're getting people that maybe are new to the, uh, to the profession, you know, they, they may struggle a little bit to understand what we were talking about there. Yeah. When you look to all the other aspects, it's easy to understand like optimized utilization, optimized flow, safety, mm -hmm. courage, organization, or purpose, everything's understandable. But yeah. when you look to this triangle things, I would try to, you know, to put those in a different words or in a different way. Uh, um, and I think that's the only thing that is like bugging me a little bit. And the other thing is, uh, I see you have uh, actually six, like six axes. Mm -hmm. uh, Hori may remember that we have studied a book called uh, Changing Organizational Culture, if I'm not wrong, yeah. uh, where we had a, a, like a, a radar, kind of a radar with the four different uh, corners. Mm -hmm. And those corners would, uh, would explain the personality of the organization or personality of the, the culture of the organization. And very much uh, when we, very similar to when we look to uh, individuals, personalities, uh, like uh, when we use the, uh, uh, like the MBTI or other tests to test personality, uh, I, I really like the thing in that book, because uh, we have these four main corners that define the personality of a company. So if I'm not wrong, in one you have like a more a cultural towards family, another more innovative, a more towards financial control or financial and market development, another towards the hierarchy and control. And um, in here, it's like uh, we could have something uh, similar to that uh, because you have these different taxes and uh, and I think this is easy to to get uh, I, I think the the structure itself is really is really interesting um, and in the uh, but look coming back to your question Aldo uh, this is summarizing everything that was discussed in the panels and the panel was so big we have so many you know subjects the, the, the level of abstraction we get in here might hide something important. Mm -hmm. And uh, may, I don't know how you're planning to do this, but uh, maybe if you have some, some way to unfold in each of these uh, topics to go a, a, a level down in terms of abstraction. And then like, let's say this iron triangle, what, what's this about? Right, uh, I, I think this is what I will try to provide. Yeah. But uh, I really like the, you know, the, the form. Uh, I like the model. Good job, well, guys. I have two uh, comments. One, uh, fascinating your insights around the Agile and the Iron Triangle. We were speaking with Scott Ambler the other day, um, one of the, the previous episodes, and he was uh, pointing towards a discomfort exactly in the same area. And I explained mm -hmm. that, well, um, the intention behind the Agile Triangle is to emphasize a focus on value. The intention behind the Iron Triangle is to emphasize a focus on conformance. So it's essentially the tension between are we on value, on quality within constraints, Agile Triangle, or are we on time, on budget, on scope, yeah, conformance, if you will, with the Iron Triangle. So, so and, think, and, and, and what if you replace those two triangles for this exactly same? Exactly, words? value and conformance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that is essentially the, the learning that we took out of these, uh, these two sessions. And uh, for the future, um, I look forward to, to doing that. Now, the second one is you probably haven't had a chance to, to, to view the first 10 episodes. Uh, in the first 10 episodes of the podcast, we actually go through every single one of these. So for Exploring uh -huh. Innovative, 
elevate, for instance, uh, we explain all three of the areas that we condensed into explore and innovate versus maintain competent oh, capability. Because okay. we, so we, we had the eight. That exactly. So it's exactly that level of... <laughs> We we start with the uh, we call it the uh, galaxy view because it's as if you're outside the galaxy uh, above the ecliptic and you're looking down on the on the sort of um, solar system and you're noticing um, that kind of the Goldilocks zone right between the outer reaches and the inner reaches. So um, for each of these, we have an episode for each and explore and innovate has kind of three uh, episodes right. So there's um, oh, the, uh, I would love to to watch all of them. Uh, absolutely, they're all available on uh, YouTube and um, Anchor and Spotify and Google Podcasts awesome. and iTunes and um, Amazon Music and um, um, Audible and and so on. So that's um, great. <laughs> when when I grow, I wanna I wanna be like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be sure to, to send you, uh, another link, but I know you're, you're so, uh, so busy, so tied up. So no, no worries whatsoever. It. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for that feedback, Samuel. It is, uh, like Korea said, um, this is one of the reasons why we are running the focus is to distill the thinking around, uh, oversight and what are the nuance and, 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 the uh, the, the different uh, things to consider when when we talk about adaptive oversight uh, in, in this space. I, I see a lot of value in these guys and especially, you know, having having passed the last three years working with large organizations and I've, I, I'm seeing that uh, leaders are, they want their organizations to be agile, but they are struggling to do that because they are having a difficult time to change their mindset and behaviors and things like that. And I see a lot of value in the work that you do, like putting all this together. And I hope you could come up with two things. One is the book that I'm <laughs> waiting for. And, and, <laughs> and the other one is a training, training for high level execs, on how to, you know, how to learn this, because these guys, they, they have the oversight function and they're doing that in the way they know, but uh, probably there are better ways to do that. And, yeah. and I think you have a lot of that knowledge in this. So it would be nice if we could yeah. bring some of these guys together. Absolutely. Now for the book, um, while we haven't written it down, we have the 10 episodes, which are the equivalent of an audio book. So we actually uh, go through the various oh, right. things. In terms of the training, um, we look forward to collaborating with um, executives and organizations. The general idea there is there's no one recipe. It's almost a, a, a meta uh, approach, right? Because I'm teaching you how to go about uh, discovering as opposed to telling you here's the discovery more often than right. not when you're engaging a consultant you're you're having the idea you will tell me what to do right because you know because it's a best practice and the lesson here is we're not operating in the simple simple realm where the situation is easily categorizable and we can say right for that you need this right you want to yeah. have lights in the room use some lighting fixtures press yeah. the button electricity will go, save the day go to the page nine nine six and you're gonna have it there no exactly <laughs> so what what happens is we're saying look this polarity approach is really handy We've done a lot of interpolation as to what might happen, what we've seen in our collective experience. We have a few hundred years worth of experience distilled into this research. But what really matters is not what theoretically or practically happens elsewhere. What matters is what's here now, right? Very much like the ancient Greeks were saying, Hikrodos Hiksalta. This is where the uh, issue is. Demonstrate now here your capability. So therefore, we need to notice in this organization right now, what are the benefits that we seek? What are the things that we're afraid of? Mm -hmm. What are the warning signs that we need to pay attention to? When do we know we've gone too far or not far enough? 
Yeah. In other words, the training itself would be how to practice the polarity mapping approach, how to navigate each and every one right. of these things. Uh -huh. But the tricky bit there is how do you develop the discipline and the wisdom to do the blue work? In other words, the reflection work and take time away from the red work of do, 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 practice, yeah. practice, practice. Yeah. yeah. That's what I call open space for change. Uh, mm. Sometimes you don't even have that. We are overwhelmed with everything. Yeah. With the, the the business as usual is consuming everything, and then <laughs> you just can't find a way to improve. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. And uh, another thing, uh, as a the way you see it, uh, or at least uh, recollecting from the panels we had, I see that you have a. Uh, a lot of uh, patterns, good ones and bad ones, mm -hmm. that can serve as examples to yep. you know to everybody. And I think this is really probably one of the most valuable things out of this work mm -hmm. that you are doing. Thank you for that, Samuel. Um, uh, that uh, again, um, this is how we intend to evolve uh, this thinking and. Uh, evolve it and co-create it going forward. And, and that's the whole intent uh, of having these podcasts and so on. Um, we did attempt, uh, yes, Aurea. I wanted to ask um, Samuel a tricky question, right? Um, it has to do <laughs> with everyone. frameworks, right? Um, <laughs> what have you seen in, in organizations, in your experience, in the impact that the adoption or implementation <clears throat> frameworks has on the work of oversight? I, I think if we are using frameworks as, as, as you said, like a, it's not a recipe, but it's a, it's a guide. It's like a, it's some, something that will guide you through, not exactly telling you how the things you need to do and how you need to do, but uh, pro, uh, uh, mostly sharing principles and values that are behind such you know behaviors and ways of thinking. Uh, when adopted with this in mind, I think frameworks help a lot, and uh, uh, and that that may require a little bit of maturity because sometimes when people are not mature. They, they may think that, uh, well, let's, let's create a squad and now we are agile. And uh, well, let's, uh, let's do Scrum and, you know, we do Scrum, but you know the rest. Uh, I, I think frameworks can help. I myself have created one, as you know, the Lean Pyramid. I recently just updated it to the fifth version. But uh, the framework itself, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, it's not... Uh, it's not like a Bible where you need to apply everything. I, I, it's it's much more like really a guidance. You have a, you have a, a things that have worked to other people, and that you can experiment, and 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 probably they can help you. But uh, don't don't go to you know, to too deep in terms of uh, or or don't don't create too much expectations in terms of uh, how frameworks will. Will, will transform your situation or, or really help. Because in the same way I've seen frameworks helping, I've seen them destroying the capability of companies to respond to change because now they had to comply with this and this and that, you know. And, and not only in terms of uh, structural frameworks like uh, SAFE or even the Lean Pyramid or maybe the, the oversights, uh, uh, but even technological frameworks, uh, we, we have seen people adopting specific libraries and things that uh, in the near future might be just uh, freezing their capacity to respond to change because mm. now they are, you know, tied to something that might be old already, you know, you can't change. And uh, I think uh, we need to take care. But uh, usually framework will help, I believe. Um. It, it would be good if we uh, just have the link uh, associated with this podcast to your framework, Samuel, so people can go and have a look. And and and, and um, so we'll get the okay. link from you. We'll share it. for. I've us. just um, tried it out. Uh, Samuel, you're going to need to check the the website SEO stuff because the the thing that Google gives 
takes us to a non-existent page. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah. oh, uh, well, actually, we are rebuilding everything right now because right. we, we right. just uh, have redesigned the, you know, the concept yeah. and then uh, we are on the way to build things. But uh, as soon as, I, b- I believe in a couple of weeks, we have everything uh, up and running, then I can share. Them. I'll supply just the main homepage. Um, that, that'll do for now because it, it, it gets us. Uh, if uh, people go and visit the transform area, you find the Lean Pyramid Hoshin Country Edition. Well done. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right. Um, what haven't we asked you that we should have? Um... That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I, one of the questions that I most like is why? Uh, why, why we are doing this, why we are here in the first place? Um, and I'm going to try to answer that, that question. Uh, in my case, and, and um, I've been developing software since 1994. And and in the early stages of my career, where I I didn't know any of Agile things, actually, it didn't exist yet. Um, I served a lot as a developer, you know, with dysfunctional leaders, dysfunctional structures, you know, bad code, bad quality, you know, lack of productivity, lots of problems. When I discovered Lean back in 2003 and started practicing, First on the engineering, helping me to fix, you know, quality issues, having to have, uh, ha- helping me to, to build more confidence on what I was doing, like uh, introducing a new chain that wouldn't break things, for example, was great uh, because we didn't have that. You, usually when we introduce something, we would break everything and we'd mm-hmm. spend time, you know, long hours trying to fix and debugging and things like that. And so that was my first wave, like fixing my technological thing, uh, improving improving quality in the code base itself, in the architecture. And then after that, I realized that, well, now I was delivering the right thing, but uh, I was delivering the wrong thing right. I was building it <laughs> correctly, but was delivering not exactly what was needed. And then I realized that was another level of management that we would have to connect, which is how to properly understand what's needed mm-hmm. and uh, how we would validate these hypotheses. How would we come up with a solution that could really fix the problems? And, and after that, how you do it in a scale? Like, let's say if we have uh, you know, several products in an organization, how we how we organize the scale, how how we connect everything else with the business strategy and so on. And uh, what I realized after years of practicing, almost 20 years now practicing Lean and Agile, next year is going to be 20 years. I realized that uh, we really can have a better life. We really can have uh, more quality, more time with people that we love. And... uh, uh, we can have more joy because uh, you know we like what we do. We don't have to spend time fixing problems. Instead, we can build the future we want to live. And uh, when I joined the Agile Alliance uh, back in 2010 uh, as a board member, uh, we had one quote that I think actually was the mission of the organization, which is to to make the software industry more human, productive, and sustainable. And I, th- I think those three words are my whys. Uh, why I am doing what I do every day, why I'm here with you guys sharing this, you know, building this. And my goal is that uh, really everybody that is listening to us here can get a better life, a more productive life, a more sustainable life, and can deliver better value. I also like uh, really much, let me see if it's over here. I bought a book recently called uh, Sooner, safer, happier. I don't yeah. know if you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've seen it. I really loved that book. Um, I think it talks a lot to me in terms of this, you know, building, because life's too short to spend, you know, with uh, 
being angry with our bosses or being angry, as you said, uh, just going to, to the job, but waiting for the Friday or just mm. waiting for the, the, the payment in the end of the month. And I, I think we need to, to find more valuable stuff to, you know, to pursue it. And, and um, sustainability, productivity, productivity, more value, those are things that uh, I would like to, to share. And that's, that's my why. So if you haven't asked why we are here, I think that's, that's the reason for me at least. Wonderful. Wonderful. A lot of the uh, episode one uh, of our podcast series covers uh, in depth uh, the why. That, why did we do it this way? Why are we doing it? Um, Etc. So uh, that, that's why we did the podcast instead of the book, for instance. Um, it's, right. it's, it, it covers that. And we also talk about Ikigai, um, yeah. uh, inspired from mm. the Japanese culture, that idea of the intersection of what do you really love doing, you're really passionate about, you're getting really good at, the world actually needs, there's great value in it, and you get paid for it. So you can make an economic life out of it as well, mm. uh, as opposed to yes. just a hobby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, you make sure that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to all of the episodes. Cool. And I'm going to send uh, feedback your way. <laughs> Please do. Leave comments. Uh, Please do. Let, let's uh, invite others. Uh, yes. Point to us and say, look at these ridiculous people, what they have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can be a little bit controversial to try. Very good. Them. Very good. Again. Okay, Samuel, it was really good having you on today's episode. Thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts, your ideas, and thank you for sharing some of your experience that we can all learn from. Um, and uh, best of luck going forward. Thank you. It's, it's really my pleasure, guys. And uh, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, once again, I would like to say how much I appreciate everything that I have learned with you, Horia. And uh, now the pleasure to know, get to know Aldo uh, and the other teammates that you have over there. I I hope to continue this collaboration and to keep learning, to keep sharing. I think uh, this way we are probably fulfilling our purpose. That's right. right? That's right. That's exactly okay. right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. So that's a wrap. I'm Aldo. I'm Horia. And thank you again, Samuel. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.